Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Welcome back for another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Bill Alpstead, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Seahawks fans, welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alpstead, sitting down with co-host Keith Myers. We're going to talk some Seahawks football today. We're going to get into maybe how to fix some of this stuff, what's going on, take a, take a look under the hood, and find out uh, specifically, I think, on the defensive side is, is where we kind of want to spend our time today. We know there's some mm-hmm. issues on the offense with Russell Wilson and so forth and Geno Smith coming in, but it seems like the problem over the last five games has been the defense for the yeah. most part and we're going to try to figure that out a little bit so hey keith how you doing man oh, i'm doing all right i'm ready to break this down because uh yeah i mean the offense is, has had its moments where it hasn't looked sharp and all of that but they've put up the points um necessary to win but the defense has been just pathetic and like you know perhaps the worst in the league and it's just it's been it's been it's been bad. Uh, they've well, only generated quite, two we're, turnovers. We're, we're kind of the worst. Three turnovers. I mean, we're kind of the worst, you know, but mm-hmm. we're not quite the worst. But we're we're pretty darn close. So I'll I'll give you some rankings. Uh, the defense ranks fifteenth in turnovers. You mentioned those turnovers, so it's right in the middle. Um, the defense ranks twenty first in points allowed, which surprised me a little bit but it's kind of the way that the defense operates um they give up a lot of yards and um, less so in total points uh they're 29th in passing yards allowed 31st in rushing yards allowed that's probably one of the more disappointing stats i knew that the pass defense was going to be bad but i thought that the run defense would be better 31st in total rushing yards allowed uh 32nd overall dead last and total 20, yards allowed. Well, they're 29th and 31st between pass and rush. They don't they don't do either of them well. They're getting gashed in both the right. by on the ground and the air. So, so let's can is there any common denominators other than um Ken Norton Jr. as the defensive coordinator? I mean, well, there's that. And so we can we can get into it. We can get into the problems. <laughs> um the problems there. But I think that what you what you've got is you've got um it, it comes to that. I mean, it comes down to you can. It depends on how you want to look at. It. Do you want to look at it as wow, the cornerbacks are, have been really bad, and so Norton's basically, um, you know, trying to, you know, use paper mache to patch up the Titanic, um, you know, by with scheme things. Or you could be like, okay, or is the problem that he's using guys in ways that aren't their optimal usage? Um, and that's just exacerbating the problem rather than trying to cover up for the weakness. Um, and you can, you know, those might be two sides to the same coin, but uh, there's definitely, I mean, you, as far as the talent side of things, it starts and ends with the, with the, uh, the cornerback position. And then after that, you've got um, a scheme and, and coordinator that, that aren't doing any of this any favors with the way that everything's put together. So in the last show, I kind of made a an argument about live and let die on the defense mm-hmm. um, in the way that they use Jamal Adams and in the way that they approach their defensive backs and trying to protect them, yet completely unable and failing to protect them. Um, so I, I figured if they're going to be exposed anyway, and we're doing all this effort to, to help them, to protect them, and that is failing. Why don't we just let them go ahead and and operate as a as their own unit and put some of the other players in position that we've tried to help mitigate the deficiencies on the back end. Let's let those players now play to their best abilities. And I'm talking specifically about guys like Jamal Adams, uh, Daryl Taylor, Jordan Brooks. Uh, Marquise Blair, Ryan Neal. There's a whole host of players that kind of are hybrid type players that the team feels comfortable enough to move them around depending on the the opponent and so forth and the scheme. Um, 
you'll see guys like Jordan Burks rush rush the passer occasionally, but he'll also be dropping back 25 yards down the field in coverage as well, um, which is probably not optimal for a guy like Jordan Brooks to be backpedaling as opposed to moving forward, which is his specialty. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with Jamal Adams. We've seen Jamal Adams be a monster when it comes to blitzing the 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 the, the quarterback and um, playing cl close to the line of scrimmage, Attacking and not carriers, so good yeah. back backpedaling and trying to cover um, cover opponents deep yeah. down the field. So let's and we've also seen um, you know guys like Benson Mayoa and um, Daryl Taylor and Robinson, Alton Robinson, and, and back into coverage and Rasheem Green dropping. You know, I mean, like so. Let's talk about let's, let's talk let's about that, that a little anymore. bit because I think a lot of people have questions about that. Like exactly what is it in the scheme that dictates that players like that that are less athletic less skilled and probably shouldn't be dropping back, especially if they're going to be covering slot guys mm -hmm. um, and not tight ends and running backs out of the backfield. What's going on in the scheme that is dictating that those players are dropping off the line of scrimmage when the ball is snapped and going into coverage? Like, how does that work, Keith? Well, part of it is that you've got guys like um, Daryl Taylor and Alton Robinson that are playing Linebacker, they're playing strong side linebacker, so it's, it's essentially giving them like a fifth defensive lineman um, against the run. Um, so their job is to play that Sam, set the edge, and um, you know, and do that. But that means that if the team, uh, in, you know, when you're in that formation, expecting them to run, and they throw it, well, you're a linebacker. You have linebacker responsibilities, and that usually means coverage. Um, but that's not where those guys excel they excel at attacking quarterbacks uh and so you have situations there where um in an effort to get their best 11 players on the field since they have depth at defensive end they've they're taking a couple of them putting them at that at that sam linebacker spot and it's causing them to against the pass be out of position now at the same time it's wonderful to have that option to have those players. Those are really great players. Oh yeah. When they're being put in a position to be successful. Now you also have players that, that are not on the field because guys like Daryl Taylor and Robinson and Mayo are dropping back into coverage. Guys like Ryan Neal, guys like Marquise Blair. Those mm -hmm. are the guys, those are your nickel and dime guys that are coming in in place of that strong side linebacker and passing downs. Um, and we've seen the effect, especially that Ryan Neal has on a football game and getting to the ball and being kind of a player that makes things happen. Yeah, he's had um, one one game where he's had an opportunity to play. And we that saw what like, he could do last year, too. That was the 49er game, and he played really, really well. And then he was a healthy scratch in the following game. So, I mean, there's got to be a decision being made there. Why is the guy that was the standout and a big surprise and a guy that really helped you, you know, the defense turn around and be better against the 49ers, then not even suit up the following week. So when like, you do both things bad, when you're bad against defending the run and you're also bad at defending the pass, the team really does have to take a look at individual matchups and just kind of flip a coin and just say, which, which player do we believe is going to have the biggest impact on the game? And um, it turns out that teams, it's so easy to pass on us that teams are opting to pass on us as kind of the go-to method of marching mm -hmm. down the field. And so I think that, you know, you really do need to kind of take a look at the effect of Daryl Taylor and Robinson and a couple of the other guys in favor of having guys like Ryan Neal and Marquise Blair on the field a lot more and having Jamal Adams then have the ability to play closer to the line of scrimmage because those guys are in the game. Yeah. And so what I, what I think is um, look at each guy, what do they do best? Right. Um, you know, Diggs is best as a single high free safety in the back where he can just roam. Right. You've got, um, Adams, who's best in, in the box, being an in-the-box strong safety that hits people hard, gets up, make tackles against the run, rushes the passer. Um, you know, Jordan Brooks is best at attacking downhill. Um, 
or you know running sideline to sideline, but not running backwards, not not trying to cover someone deep. So put him in a zone, which is fine, but don't give him an, an opportunity where uh, he can attack downhill at the ball at some point. Um, figure out whatever what each player does well, and make them do that. Um, that to me, that is the the basic is, thing. That's the basics. That's the basics of coaching. Put players in an opportunity to, where they can be successful. Asking Adams to be your in, and to play as you know with with two high safeties and so having him cover um, as like a you know a second free safety in the back. Half and right now he's playing close to forty percent of the snaps, doing just that. Exactly, and so he's doing he's doing that a lot. That's not. I mean, can he do it? Sure. Um, there are other people. Marquise know, Blair's are, probably better. a better player to be doing that. He is, you know, or so, or Amadi, you know, so, given the Amadi's size, maybe Marquise Blair's a better better option there, but well, maybe not. Given Amadi's um, play so far this year, um, I mean, you got to have somebody say, that's going to be able to <laughs> cover somebody <laughs> to do that. But Blair, Blair, or, or Neil might be um, a better choice. But you know, these are the types of things that I'm yeah you know, that I'm looking at. Is I'm like, okay, how do we put? How do we get these guys in position? Uh, so let's. Honestly, I'm going to stop you right there, just really quick. Well, go ahead and finish your point, but I want to talk I was about say, the coaching decisions. If you're going to, um, if you're going to look at this, you look at each player and, and how to do that. I know they're trying to get their their best eleven on the field, and that's why you end up with guys like Taylor and Robinson at the strong side linebacker. But isn't getting your best eleven on the field, um, letting those guys be defensive ends? Um, letting bringing in another safety like Marquise Blair to be the extra free safety in the back and turning Jamal Adams loose up near the line of scrimmage. And so you run with basically you run with Jamal Adams as that third linebacker, right. even if even though even though you are technically playing in the nickel. So let me ask you this you and I have come to the same conclusions, and and also I, I will say many. Many, many people have been talking about exactly what we're talking about right now. Yeah. I mean, it's not, so, it's not hold, hard hold to on. see. So, so the coaches have got to see this as well. So my question is, is this a purposeful resistance to a known solution? Or are we talking about a we know better situation and we're putting – this is the way that we went through camp. This is the way that we identified how we were going to play in the off season. And damn it, we're going to play this way no matter what. Or is it a an incompetence situation at the highest level? Not necessarily Pete Carroll, but uh, we'll put Pete on the list. Fine. Some people want to talk about Pete. That's fine. Uh, we'll have a deeper conversation about that at some other point. But as it relates to the defense and then – um, Ken Norton Jr. and how these decisions, maybe some of these guys like Andre Curtis, some of these other guys that have input on this thing, um, how they're making the decisions, like well, the process of making the decision to either play or not play these guys, where they play, how the scheme is drawn up for that week against that opponent, and having it not work so consistently consistently for example and i gave this stat in the previous show we're giving up 450 yards a game and we've done so for four straight weeks that's only the fourth team in nfl history mm -hmm. to allow 450 yards to four straight opponents so the the ideas that are formulated during the week and being implemented on game day is completely disconnected from the ability to be successful yeah and that's just not the way pete carroll operates it just it just isn't and so, so where is that disconnect okay so there's the that is that's such a complex question um in that and all that so let's start with a couple of different things one um i mean every, pete carroll's the head coach it's his team so yes some of the blame will always always lay with him because he's the guy um in the end the buck stops with him. He's there's no one else that he can pass it to. Um, but at the same time, the way this team works and the way that it's always worked um, under Pete Carroll is that he is in charge of the big picture things. 
but the details are up to the coordinator. That's why he has a defensive coordinator. That's why the defensive coordinator calls the plays. Um, and so he is in charge of the big picture things, but honestly, it feels like it's the details that are being lost. Yeah, they have plays in the playbook for, you know, where they play cover two and they have, um, you know, both safeties back, but that doesn't mean they have to go to that repeatedly. Um, they also have plays in the playbook where they have the big nickel and they've got Marquise Blair on the field. Um, where's that? Why aren't we seeing that more? You know what I mean? So it's like these are these are the are the individual um, decisions which are going to, and I would say it's the it's it's um, it is. <sighs> Uh, Ken Norton Jr. and you know the other senior defensive staff because they're the ones that are putting together and implementing this plan that isn't working. And I do think some of it is a stubbornness because it is what they worked on in camp and it is what they how they identified how they were going to do this. And look at last year. We were, everyone, including you and I, were looking at that defense that was historically bad. Like they were going to be the worst pass defense in NFL history through um, a bunch of the games. And we were like, oh my God, something's got to change. And you have, hear Pete Carroll going, no, 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 we're getting there. We're close. Like we, you, we can see it. It's about to happen. And then it did turn around. And the patience that they showed um, was worthwhile. And you don't want to scrap something that you've worked really hard on um, because they're just not quite to the level of um, execution yet. Um, so if the coaches feel that it's, they're close, they're getting there, they're about to turn this corner, then you know what? Just suck it up. It's going to be bad, but do what you got to do to get past that point to make it work. I don't know if we're there and I don't see anything that's causing me, uh, confidence that that's going to happen again, but that might be where they're at. Um, so, so I've talked a, a few different times in a couple different shows now about reaching a point where we're, we're at a point now where we're just starting to throw stuff out there to see if it works, experimenting, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Why not? And yeah. So yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, if you were the the coach there, would you would you just do what we've been talking about? Is that is that experimenting, quote unquote, or is it just going back to the basics and finding out if your basic idea of the way a defense is structured and should work? can work or is it beyond that where they know it won't work and that's why they're doing what they're doing now um because they're hiding certain players the scheme is weak you know in a couple different spots and so forth so they're trying to mitigate that yeah. um, but going back to just basic stuff blocking and tackling um maybe that gives us the best chance at least to find the baseline of what the defense is even capable of. I just, I don't know. I'm really I frustrated. Know. I think everyone's frustrated. We should I know be. that everyone's talking about Ken Norton Jr. needs to go and all that stuff. I thought Ken Norton, to be completely honest, last year when we were at this point, you know, eight games into the season, I thought for sure at the end of the year, maybe even before that, that his name would come up into the hat. And and quite honestly, when I heard the very first thing I heard at the end of the year where a, a coach was released, and before I heard the name, you Brian Schottenheimer, was, I thought it was, it was Norton. Ken Norton yeah. Jr. And I, so, I did. I, I'll tell you, I had the same thought, especially because Pete had just come out and said, no, Shotty's coming back. And then the next day you hear the Seahawks are, yeah, have yeah, let go right. coordinator. And then you're, you're like, all right, Ken Norton Jr. And it's like, nope. Schottenheimer, and you're like, huh, interesting. Um, I t I'll tell you, I don't think Norton will get fired. Um, I said this last year. Not in year, season. Not even after season. Because um, Pete Carroll has said that letting Norton leave. At, you well, know, what's the worst case scenario coach. for you in this season and, and the record? I'm just curious. Uh, the record? Yeah, the rec our record, like at the uh, end of the year. Um, well, Five wins? Wilson if Wilson's missing eight games, um, yeah, I'm looking at five wins. So five wins won't get your defense coordinator fired for having the worst defense in the NFL for uh, a season and a half out of the pre prior two seasons. 
Um, I don't think so because it's Ken Norton and Pete Carroll. Oh. But here's here. But here's let me let me let me go through and and um, preface that because it's not just that he won't get fired because yeah, I don't think he will. But that doesn't mean he'll retain the same job title. See, when Pete Carroll let uh, that's Ken too Norton, much. That's too much loyalty, right there. When when Pete Carroll let uh, Ken Norton Jr. I admire leave Pete to, for loyalty to I the really Raiders. Do. Um, to the Raiders to promote Chris Richard, um, you know that ended up he never really was ecstatic, ecstatic with the job Richard did. There was always that bit of regret, um, and then when he got got the opportunity, he brought he let Richard go and brought Norton back. Um, and he has he said that letting Ken Norton Jr. leave was like one of the worst mistakes he's made as a coach. Um, you don't say that and have all of this and then fire the guy um, a couple of years later. So what I think what, we, what we've got is a situation where at the end of the year, you promote, or you promote him, you change his title to assistant head coach, and you let him go back to doing what he's great at, which is coaching individual players, motivating um, the stuff that he was fantastic as as a linebacker coach um, with some more big picture like responsibilities and then you hire it you hire a different I, defensive coordinator that I, can actually I honestly do the job. think that um in this particular situation I know exactly what you're saying I don't think that that works because a guy at the highest levels and he at that point would have been at the highest levels in coaching as a defensive coordinator for five years in two te two teams um, to take a step back, even if it's only in a in a title and so forth, to have that personality on your coaching staff where you've got a new guy. Let's just say we do the same thing that we did uh, on the offensive side of the ball in 2021 and brought in Shane Waldron. We do the same thing with the defensive coordinator in, in 2022 uh, to have a guy like Ken Norton Jr., a very strong guy, a very proud guy still there as a presence um, might be a worse situation than if he was gone. I don't know because you, but, but again, you're not, you're not, you're not demoting him. You are, you're actually promoting him. You're making him assistant head coach. You're yeah, giving but he him. He knows the deal. He knows the deal. And you're pulling him off. So does everyone that, else. Those particular responsibilities to give him other ones. Um, so yeah, he does know the deal, but this isn't, wouldn't be the first time that Pete Carroll has done this exact move. Rocky Sato was his defensive coordinator um, at USC, came to the, the Seahawks with the expectation that he was going to be the defensive coordinator. Instead, uh, they kept Gus Bradley, who had been here um, the previous year. And, and Sato basically took the demotion. And then every like little bit, they had to – you know, scratch that ego and give him more responsibility, give him a better, bigger title, give him a raise in order to keep him around. Um, because, and especially when, um, when he, when the one guy left, uh, Dan Quinn, um, they had, they brought him in um, to be the defensive coordinator. And then Rocky Sato still here in Seattle, um, you know, but they made him assistant head coach. Why would there. we want to do that with Ken Norton Jr.? Uh, because given the failure of not only with us, but with the Raiders and then back with us, he didn't fail, you know, his first time he, around with he us. Didn't, Obviously, yeah, he was a position he, coach. I get that. But as a defensive coordinator, he, it's just not worked for him. It hasn't. And so. I understand loyalty. I admire that about Pete. I really do. I think it's awesome. Um, and in the way that Pete uses it, it's not just in name only. He really believes this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but but at this point, I don't know if it makes sense for the Seahawks to, to continue that sort of relationship brings, when you're trying to basically more... burn it down. You got to, this defense would be so bad for so long that you have to completely wipe it clean and start over and yeah but from personnel players coaches i know I it's pete's defense but what i'm saying is it's so bad you don't have a lot to build on 
You just yeah. don't. You got well, Bobby Wagner there, and maybe, maybe and we can start talking about this in the in the next few weeks if things don't go as we'd like them to go. You start talking about moving on from Bobby Wagner. This you team start goes talking about Owen, moving on from other players. Yeah, if this team goes zero and three into the bye with losses to the Steelers and the Jaguars in that, and they're sitting at, at Trevor two Lawrence's and, first win, and, and and you're sitting at two and six. Yeah, you know what? If, if a team if a team like um, you know that, that's trying to make a run at this, um, like the Packers are are dangling a you know um, a first round pick in favor of Wagner and a third, you got you got to consider it because you're not going anywhere at two and six. Well, and then you're moving back into the first round, yeah, which we do not have a pick right now. Which is a, so you it, do start thinking about you do start thinking about rebuilding your team when you're mm -hmm. when you're at that point okay so what do we what do we want to do now to try to fix this if if things go marginally okay in the next uh four or five weeks while russell wilson's on the sidelines well i think what you've got to do is you've got to do what you and i started out the show talking about and that's putting players in position to do what they do best which means um stop asking Rasheem Green to, and, and Daryl Taylor to drop into coverage all the time. And instead... And Jordan them, Brooks. Uh, well, and the thing is, Jordan Brooks has He's had, not bad. He's not he, bad. He's just better up he moving is, he, forward. And that's the thing. He is He's better moving forward, but he's not He's not bad. And the, the thing is, you've got to, as a linebacker, you got to be able to do, depending on what the play call is and whatever. I mean, haven't, he does both. Um, let him are be, we let better him be off? Blocked. Are we better off playing eighty percent? You know, in dime, in dime, and, and not and playing nic and nickel, and just um, having and, f having six defensive backs on the field. At well, all yeah, times. no, you're not. I mean, you're the, the defensive backs are the weakest. If, is the if weakest that defensive the back though is Ryan Neal or Marquis Blair, those guys can come up and thump too. So you're not losing too much on on defending the run or tackling when you have guys like that out there? Uh, it's no more than just thumping. It's about filling gaps and, and um, that kind of stuff. Being but you able still to come have your blocks. line integrity. You still have your, you still have Bobby Wagner out there. So. Yeah, but that's all you have is Bobby Wagner out there. You have your linemen and your, and Bobby Wagner, and then you're asking defensive backs to come up and, and be linebackers. And that's not a, that's yeah, but that not would a, be seven back in coverage. I'm talking like six. So you'd still have two linebackers or five defensive linemen. Plus if you five. have no, see so you're you're five you're, or six. You're you're sorry, my math's you, your your math okay. is a little off there. Okay. Um four is normal for defensive Maybe that's backs. The key. Five the key five. is to have twelve defensive players on the field. And that's now, a penalty, if we can swing so. that, just get, get um, that invisibility cloak from Harry Potter. <laughs> no, we'd be in business. No, but I think you I think you have um you have a situation where playing in the nickel which they, this was a team that, that used to do that. They used to be in the nickel more than any other team. Um, and that was kind of the trend, right? So the, the CX were kind of on the cutting edge of that. And then they lost a bunch of defense uh, cornerbacks and people left and, and they had what they thought was a trio of really good linebackers. So then they switched and went the other direction and played in the base more than any other team. And that didn't really work well. Um, and now they don't really seem to have an identity that way. I think going to the nickel where you have five defensive backs and you go ahead and you play cover two where you have, um, you know, Blair and Diggs both each tech covering a half the field deep and you let your cornerbacks come up and play the flat in the, that zone. So you play that, that cover two. And you notice I didn't say Jamal Adams because mm -hmm. Jamal Adams is then um, in the box as essentially uh, an extra linebacker, even though you know he's safety and he doesn't, he's not going to line up in in ones on one side of the of the formation. He's going to mm -hmm. come from wherever is necessary and and that kind so of stuff. So then, what do you do with Daryl Taylor in this situation? Keith? You play it, play him at defensive end. So you take a guy like Kerry Hyder out, yeah, and you allow Daryl Taylor to come back and play yeah. the five tech. And so you let Daryl Taylor and Kerry Hyder um, rotate at that five tech position. Um, you move Rasheem Green full time to the three tech, and Dunlap still plays on the other side. Dun Dunlap and um, Robinson on the other mm -hmm. side, and I then think you that's let, a, actually I really like the direction that you're talking about right now. And then you let Benson Mayo play here or there as guys need 
need, need, you know, need spots. Um, but I really think you can get a lot, you can get a lot done with that. And I know Why that aren't we doing this right now? What is preventing the Seahawks from implementing what we've just talked about? I think it's stubbornness. Do you I do. think it's the answer? Um, it's the only answer, actually. It I is mean, the only alternative. I, I, honestly, I don't. I don't see the current scheme and the current way that they're doing stuff working well. Um, and perhaps they don't want to play cover two. They want to stay, stick to the cover three. Um, okay, but if you're going to do that, you can still do that in the nickel. Something's um, happening in that short zone stuff, though, where that handoff happens. You know, your receivers get seven yards uh, mm -hmm. down the field and your your uh, safety and your linebackers drop off their coverage and transition that to your yeah, guys and something right there is not happening correctly. Yeah. That's that, that, that's been a, been a concern. I mean, there, that, that transition isn't, it isn't happening the way it's supposed to. There's the communication isn't happening the way that it's supposed to. And it's really leading to, to uh, problems for this defense. And that's, you know, part of that is the, this transition with all these new players um, guys like Sidney Jones, which weren't even here in training mm -hmm. camp. And um, Trey Brown's on his way in. So yep. We'll see. And, and and so that's part of it. But it was a problem last year, too. Same. Right? Same, same problem. Exact, same exact problem. Um, so why is it still a problem? How can you not fix it? And if you can't fix it with the players that you've got, then you need different players because if your scheme depends on something so fundamental like just communication and the people refuse to do what you ask of them and that's communicate then your scheme can't work with those players and you need different players or you need a different scheme so take your pick yes <laughs> right yep all right I think, you know, we could talk about this for a long time and really we, not completely know if we are going to be successful in implementing what our thought process is. The thing is, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a thing where you and I can talk about this all we want, but until the team watches the tape and sees what you and I see, or at least they probably, maybe they probably see it. I mean, I can't imagine they, they don't. Um, but until they come to the same conclusion that you and I have about the fact that they need to do something s schematically different to take advantage of the talents of the players they have, yes. um, until, until they come to that conclusion, it doesn't matter what you and I, uh, see and what we talk about and what we want to see happen because the coaches have to come to the conclusion that what they're doing isn't working and the answer is to do something else. Okay. We'll leave it there. Let's do it. So the final show of the week is going to be a preview show of the, is it Sunday night again this week? Sunday night football game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. We travel to the East Coast. It'll be a game with a first start uh, after the Russell Wilson injury which is frightening all in of itself, but um, Geno Smith's capable. I think we saw that in the first drive that that uh, when he came in, really took command of the of the team and the offense, uh, made some nice line calls at the line of scrimmage, changed out of some plays. I thought that that was encouraging um, for mm -hmm. what is going to need to happen in the next four, four games or so. Anything can happen, but um, it's encouraging at least that he's able to be yep. serviceable. Yeah, it's really too bad that that um, that this is the stretch of, of the year where, where Wilson's out because he missed more than half of uh, the Thursday night primetime game. This week, they're primetime Sunday night, and then the following week, they're primetime Monday night against the Saints. So three state straight primetime games with Geno Smith at quarterback. Well, good for Geno. You know, it, it's, it's, it's hard, I would imagine, to be a quarterback that knows you're not going to play, that you're going to show up every week and you're going to be just as dedicated to the process as if you were starting. And here he is, he's, he's, the opportunity is now thrust upon him and he's there to seize it. And I admire that. I think that's pretty cool actually. So, okay, let's get out of here. Follow my, uh, Keith <laughs> at Myers NFL, not follow Myers, um, Myers NFL. I'm at NWC Hawk. The show is at Hawks playbook. 
SeahawksPlaybook.com has all the stuff, the, the website for the show, uh, your favorite podcast platforms, and YouTube. Subscribe on those, please. That would be awesome. So, until next time, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Phil is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.